It's time for Talking Pints. This time, for the first time ever on this segment, the drinks are going to come at the end. I know this looks a little bit different. We'll explain it all as and when we get there. I'm very pleased to be joined by Hal robson Carnu. Hal, you know, for someone who's been a Premier League footballer, international footballer, now a big pundit on telly, um, you know, it happens, doesn't it, that famous footballers get to meet celebrities and get to meet royalty and get to meet stars. Mm. But you began your life meeting all of these people. Tell us about the first years of, of Hal's life. Yeah, no, so my, my upbringing was relatively unique in the sense where my grandfather was vicar of Kensington. And, and at that moment in time, you know, the parish was, you know, it was, it was booming and everyone, there was, uh, you know, a, a fantastic uh, group and a community in that area who were, you know, obviously would attend St. Mary Abbott's Church uh, on, on a weekly basis. And it was capacity every week. And so I saw my grandfather, you know, adore by so many different people, as well as my grandmother, who, who was obviously the vicar's wife. And so I had a very unique experience in terms of upbringing because, you know, they're, they're, the vicarage backs onto Billionaires Row. Um, you know, it backs onto, obviously, what is Kensington Palace. Yeah. And so, you know, I saw lots of different people in all different walks of life um, from a very early age, which I think, for me, w was really informative, uh, particularly then ultimately going into football where there's a lot of adulation again and there's a lot of uh, hype uh, and... and uh... But this is growing up and you've got sort of Princess Margaret's around the place and mm. Diana's around the place mm. and the Jaggers are around. It's extraordinary, really. Yeah, yeah, it, it was extraordinary for, for sure and, and I think it allowed me to, to sort of see different, as I said, different walks of yeah. life because they're, they're normal people. You know, as much as we build them up and as much as the media and the press will build them up and uh, they're, they're normal people and, they, and, and they're, 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 they're relatively uh, you know, simple in terms of you know, what they what they want from life. You know, they, they generally want to have a good life and uh, are trying to do what they, they they can do to have that. So yeah, it was uh, as I said, re really unique. Um, very grateful, um, and it also allowed me to have a level of grounding because my grandmother would you know stop and speak with any homeless person on the streets of Kensington. Mm. And, you know, they would see her coming and they would know she'd stop and she'd bend down and actually talk to them, touch them. And I was a three, four, five-year-old child at the time. And, and it sort of opened your eyes in terms of that passion and that kindness. And, you know, something which, again, you know, Princess Diana was uh, very much well, well known for. No, absolutely. But from being a little boy, you wanted to be a footballer. Mm -hmm. And you suffered one or two injuries in your teens. And we're going to come back to yes. those injuries. But, you know, in the end, you get there and you're playing for Reading and you're scoring goals and you get promoted to the Premier League. That must have been a huge moment. Yeah, look, every every kid's dream who plays football is to play in the Premier League. And mm. that's what you want to do. And that was mine. And so to have achieved it, you know, still relatively young age, I think I was 21, 22 at the time, uh, was a very proud moment. But the background behind that for me meant more because, you know, I suffered two major cruciate knee ligament injuries as a teenager. Mm. And the doctors who did the surgeon who operated at the time said I would never play pain-free again. And so after two and a half years on the treatment table, really not expecting to have a career and certainly not l expecting to get to the heights of, you know, Premier League playing, the Premier League playing against the world's a real dream, best man. players. Yeah, it, it was it was a really special moment for yeah. me and, and a real proud achievement. Injury is, I mean, for all professional sports players, all sports players, injury is just a, a complete nightmare. But you go on from that and, you know, it's West Bromwich Albion and, and I understand you hold a Premier League record. You were the only person in one game to come on as a substitute, score a goal, and get sent off. Tell us about that. You've been doing your research, Nigel. Yeah, really good. Um, that was at Burnley away uh, for West Bromwich Albion. And, yeah, it was um, it, really innocuous, to be honest. I've, I've caught the, uh, the the opposition player with my elbow accidentally. Um, there was, I think there was a bit of blood around as well. And, you know, it happens. It wasn't nice, yeah. but it wasn't intentional. But the referee thought it was... Uh, well, that may dangerous. not be the record that you want. Mm -hmm. but, the, but the thing that people will remember you for, of course, is playing for Wales... And, you know, sort of Johan Cruyff-like, mm, turning yeah. and scoring. Yeah, and yeah. kind of Welsh football, having been in the doldrums, it's mm. been going through some better years, hasn't it? Yeah, it has. And, and I think that, that was part of a, a, a generation of 
players and managers who changed the shape of Welsh football. And again, I qualified to play through Wales, uh, for Wales through my grandmother, who was born in Caerphilly. Um, and so they brought together a group of players who were playing at the top level, surrounded, uh, you know, surrounding a an elite player in Gareth Bell and other obviously top, top players too. Uh, but we were able to generate a level of success and fundamentally it was down to the team and the togetherness that we achieved it. And, you know, the, it really started from Gary Speed, who unfortunately, you know, passed away and committed suicide, which was, very, you know, difficult period for all of the players involved. But he was the real uh, catalyst to make that change in allowing Welsh players and a Welsh team to compete at an international level, and obviously we've just seen another international. Well, I've got to say, I mean, you know, you were part of that as it was beginning and reaching Euro final, you know, the, the finals of the Euros and yeah. stuff. But the first time since 1958, yes, yeah, that precisely. Wales have been to, and you were there, of course, in uh, Qatar. Mm -hmm. uh, what does that mean for Welsh football? Yeah, again, it, it, I think it for, for all of the home nations, you know, being British, I think it's important that they do well, you know, because it does it it changes shape. It, it, you saw when England went out went out of the tournament, everyone's downhearted the next day. You know, it was a Saturday night. I don't know if you watched the game, but yeah. you know, twenty three million no, people. No, I, 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 mean, I, mean, I think cheesed off as an understatement. So, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so I think, and it's the same for Welsh, but I think as uh, for the home nations, I yeah. think it's fantastic to see them doing well. And in in that two thousand and sixteen tournament, we carried the home nation through to the semi finals, and you know, we 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 came back heroes. You beat Belgium. We did. Yeah, one of the great. No, it must have been a wonderful, wonderful moment for you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Talking of England. Uh, you know, losing and a bit unlucky, really. I mean, we didn't play badly at all, mm. uh, I thought. But hey, there you were on ITV with this vast audience mm. watching. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you enjoy being a pundit? Yeah, it's it's good because I think you know there's not many players who have recently finished playing who are talking on the game and giving their insight. So you've gone in quite quickly, really. Yeah, relatively quickly. Um, but I think it's a, a good opportunity, as I said, to, to share some real real current insight into players. And uh, a lot of players, when they're playing, you you can't necessarily say the things that you want to say. And and sometimes that's at detriment to yourself and to your perception because actually you would have dealt with the situation in a different manner. But it may not have been politically correct or, you know, for the club's interest and you're ultimately employed by the club. And we saw the fallout with Ronaldo at Manchester United. What can happen when a player, uh, you know, says something against the grain? Yeah. And so, yeah, I think for, for me, it's a, a really unique opportunity. And again, you know, I, I was in a position where I finished playing because I wanted to focus on building a business in yeah. health drinks, health yeah, shots. Yeah, yeah. And obviously we're, we're talking pints, we're we should be that. talking shots. No, we're going to do it, um, don't but, worry, we're going to do that, it. That was, the, yeah. that was the, the, the real passion of mine in, in allowing me to you know, ultimately bring health and wellness to, to people in all different walks of life. And finishing off with the World Cup, you were there with Gary Neville, of course. Yes. And Gary decided to make it a party political broadcast on behalf of, it might have been the Labour Party or a party to the left of that. How did that go down? Yeah, look, I think Gary Neville, he, he, he's clearly talking on some very important topics. And actually, as I said before, a lot of players won't do that. And they'll actually say, well, I'm going to take a step back and I'm not going to get involved. But mm. he's putting himself forward. So I think that first and foremost deserves credit in terms of what mm. he's saying, in terms of what he's saying and, and, and the positioning of what, what he's trying to trying to get across. Of course, it, it can be taken in very different ways, but it's coming from a good place. And actually, in my opinion, I would say he is closer to the everyday person than the majority of politicians. He may, may not be, but I think to compare, you know, strikers in this country to people who worked on the stadiums in Qatar was right. I think ITV have got a problem here, because if you're going to go on doing that, they're going to have to have somebody with an opposing political view, and then it won't be, there won't be any football. <laughs> and, uh, having suffered, as you said, you know, and having, in a way, been very fortunate to have a football career at all, mm. given the cruciate ligament problems, mm -hmm. takes us into turmeric, your business, and these <laughs> drinks. So, so take it away. Yeah, so essentially I used this blend of raw turmeric with other potent natural ingredients such as watermelon, pineapple, pomegranate to effectively recover from the pain that I was experiencing from the injuries that I'd had. And so... I was using anti-inflammatories, which mm -hmm. my body was having adverse effects to. I would pass blood in my urine the day after having, having had them. Um, and I would have severe nausea as well. So I couldn't shift this pain without taking these prescribed drugs, 
or I had to continue to try and persevere and try and play it with a level of restriction, which is impossible for any footballer. And you mentioned that pain and injury is the worst thing yeah. for footballers. Pain and injury is the worst thing for anyone in any walk of life. Fair point. And a lot of people suffer from that in silence on a daily basis. So this product, as I said, you know, the blend, my father actually created it by combining these raw natural ingredients. And within six weeks of taking it, I was pain free. And this wow. was from 17 to 18. A year later, I made my first team debut. A year after that, I made my international debut and went on to have the career that I had. And I was using these shot as my secret weapon throughout my whole career. And the reason why I decided to bring it to market mm. was because we saw what was on shelf in retailers. We realized that there were functional ingredients, functional products, which actually really weren't. So if you look at the majority of say functional shots on shelf, they're full of apple juice. They are very low in the raw functional properties of the key functional ingredients. Okay. So things like turmeric, ginger, pineapple. So what we've done is bring a product which really changed and my your, life. And it's your business. To, and to, 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 to yeah, market. Your business, you believe in it. You've got customers that believe in it. Big Pharma don't like you. Um, but I think it's only appropriate then that we do yeah, the honours. Yeah, exactly. Make sure you shake it well. All oh, right. Please, yeah. There we go. I'm such a novice at this. I don't know what to do. <laughs> right. And, it, and it's, it's, it's a down, down in one. Down in one. It's a shot. Yeah. It's, it's, a not, shot. it's not a pint. It's a shot. Right. Very good. Thank you. Here goes. It Well, oh gosh, a go. kick to that. Yes, very good. I'm not sure it's going to be my number one Christmas drink, but it's <laughs> OK. And Hal, thank you for joining me on Talking Pints.